I'd like to say welcome to all of you for coming to this session, Hurting Pipelines, Jenkins' Code at Southwest Airlines. I'm Margaret Haskamp. I'm Senior DevOps Analyst. This is Sandeep Baba, and he is our tech lead. I would um, hope that we can share a little bit about our journey today, talk about what the, the struggles were. First of off, I want to talk about the journey of Southwest, Southwest Airlines. And I think what's really struck me about the DevOps journey is it's kind of been a, a picture of what happened with Southwest. Uh, when I started uh, 20 years ago, we had half as many cities that we fly to as we do today. So tremendous growth and all of the pain that goes with growth. This is my second time in Southwest.com. And when I got back, we're doing DevOps. And it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to see the, the differences. Um, what we're going to talk about today is just kind of go over what our problems were, what our solution was. And then Sandeep is going to go through a demo and kind of walk through that step by step, what it looks like for how we automated the Jenkins master and how we automated creation of the jobs. So the problem. How many of you have problems in DevOps right now? Just, just a couple. Uh, fortunately, we're bringing solutions too. So we have now hundreds of developers that we're supporting. There was an increasing demand for creating job after job. And you know, you look at your Jenkins one day, and I, like that's over a thousand jobs. You know, and hundreds and hundreds of active jobs. When you start getting into that level of of need for automation, you really have to bring some solutions. But at the same time, it's like trying to change the tires on the car while it's going down the road, right? So all of those challenges. Our group isn't, isn't that big. Our DevOps group is, uh, on average, about five people uh, supporting hundreds of developers. So every time a new job was needed, we'd have to go into the UI and create a freestyle job. and and then a week later, I find I'm creating a really similar job. And that's, that's that point where you say, if I have to do it twice, I'm thinking about automation. And if I have to do it three times, I really want to automate this. Um, we found that there were similar kinds of jobs um, that fell into some major categories. So we found ourselves doing the same thing over and over again. And also, as we looked at the complexity in our Jenkins environment, you're like, what if that goes down. Do I really feel really, really strong about my recovery process? How hard is that going to be to bring that up and make sure that I have every plugin right and I don't get the wrong version and I have the configuration right and my variables are going to be right? It, it's a little scary, right? I'm probably not the only one who felt that way and I know Sandeep isn't either. So our solution, in a nutshell, automate creation of the Jenkins, automate creation of the jobs. And I'm not going to talk too much about that because uh, our tech lead, Sandeep, is going to go into more detail about that. But basically, what we started to realize is the same thing that we do for our developers, which is provide CI, we need to, to use that same process for ourselves and CI for CI. Sandeep, can you talk a little bit more about uh, why that's important for the developers. I mean, enough about us and our team. Why is that impactful for the developers? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, Jenkins World. Uh, so as a developer, I want to concentrate more on writing my code and uh, be less dependent on other teams. Like, let's say I need a new job. I need to go create a ticket for another team um, and wait for them to complete it. So how good would it be if I uh, have the job configuration codified and the Jenkins configuration is available inside the source code repository, version controlled, and peer reviewed? You know, often when you configure a job, you do it by yourself. You go to configuration, edit it, and save it. And it is often error prone, right? So what if it is there in the repository, and then you create a pull request, and you peer reviewed it? And then uh, global shared libraries. So how many times you write the same Gradle W build command? If you have 100 jobs, you write the same command 100, 100 number of times, right? So what if I have a way to uh, 
uh, we use it as a shared library wherein I can write the command only just once and can reuse it. And then uh, what if I can automate the creation of jobs? Let's say I have 500 jobs and my Jenkins server is down. And uh, I have to bring it, up, bring it back up and running and what is the best way to do it? So what if I automate the creation of jobs itself, uh, again, using Groovy and be version control it so that when my Jenkins comes up, the configuration, the plugins, and the jobs are up and available for me to use it. And Jenkins master deployment. So how easy is it to get your Jenkins back up and running with the same configuration, same plugins, and with the same number of jobs? Uh, so we have used the advantage of using Docker here. So we have used a base Jenkins Docker image. And then on top of it, we have wrote automation uh, on how do you install plugins inside the container? And how do you uh, configure, configure things like credentials, the EC2 cloud, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna show you in my demo how we have used the Docker image and built some automation on top of it and step by step going through the entire process. So over long talks, every time there was a problem pretty much, we came up with a lot of ideas for how this, how this should look as we took this journey toward automation. The thing is you have to sell it, right? We all have leaders and you're like, I have this great idea, it's gonna take um, a few months. Uh, would, would it be okay if, so you start having these conversations with leaders, and leaders care about basically three things, primarily when you start to talk about projects and cost and resources. You know, what are you gonna get for it? We're gonna get more speed, we're gonna get more consistency, and that's where the quality comes in. And it's gonna cost less. We're going to be fully automated, hopefully with the jobs running faster, we're able to spin down those EC2 instances and, and not use as much uh, AWS time. And we all know that the meter's running when you've got your AWS running, right? So uh, for those of you that are in there now, and, e and even if you're not, the important thing is to know that you're not using any more resources than you really need to use for that. So all of the things in that area weren't under our control, but we knew for sure that this part was under our control and if we could automate this, automate our Jenkins and automate the job creation, this area that we did have control over could really have some, some real performance gains, increase the consistency and quality and lower our costs. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, talk more on how we use shared libraries so how many of you use pipelines today? How many of you use shared libraries? Right, okay, good amount. So uh, shared library is basically uh, a chunks of reusable code, so you can store it inside a repository, and basically you can reuse it in, in over and over on number of jobs. So why shared library? Creating your DSL will bring consistency, so if you have uh, some configuration or some commands, written inside a shared library, so you're confident that how, how many ever jobs you create out of that, they all behave the same way. One of the problems with freestyle jobs is like you create one job today and tomorrow you just modify it and it behaves differently. So here there is no chance of you going inside and manually editing any configurations. Everything is written as a code and it is stored inside a shared library. And don't repeat yourself, right? So when you write the scripts and when you write a command for the second time, you're repeating yourself. So why not use uh, a Groovy script to do the same? And then improve the scalability. How easy is it to scale the number of jobs you have? Let's say you have 100 jobs today and you have a new project and I got a task where I have to create some 50 more jobs. So how easy is it, uh, because I have my shared library ready, I just create a Jenkins file and then call all the shared libraries I want and my job is ready. It is just like whether it is one job, 50 jobs, or 100 jobs. And by using shared libraries, you can also skip the Groovy sandbox. Here is a structure of shared libraries. So a shared library has, it can be different. So this is how we have implemented it. So it basically consists of three main folders, source, vars, and resources. 
The source folder is where you write all your job configuration, your classes, and your methods. And then VARS is where you store all the reusable code, like the Gradle commands, the Maven commands, and whatever the tests you run. So you store all of them inside the VARS. And then resources is where you can uh, define your environments. So let's say you have a QA environment and you run a different Jenkins for that. And it needs entirely a different configuration and different set of jobs. So I can write all of that configuration inside a JSON file. And when I'm running my seed job, which creates other jobs, it goes through all the resources and it'll create that environment for me painlessly and securely. So let's talk a little bit on freestyle jobs and I'll talk more on how we can solve it using Jenkins as a code, right? So creating the jobs using UI is labor intensive. So developers often, depending on Jenkins team, so you have a set of developers who are Jenkins experts, developer creates a ticket and you do it. And what if the number of jobs are growing? Like managing them will be very difficult because uh, it is tedious and time demanding. What if there are two, three projects which started up the same time and they all need several tens of jobs? So it's time consuming, right? And then manually updating the job. So we have, we went through this pain wherein we used to use all Maven jobs, all Maven in our Jenkins builds and we want to uh, convert into Gradle. So we, let's say we have around 600 jobs, so we have to go through each job and then change all the configuration manually, and it's a pain. And then lack of powerful and easy ways to specify deployment flow through code. So you don't have any, any process, you, you just have to do everything manually through UI. And backup and disaster recovery methods. So if you have a freestyle job setup and your Jenkins is down, so you are very much dependent on your backup, right? So if that's where you store all your config.xml files, your job configuration, your plugins, including the versions and all that stuff. So in the event of a disaster, if you don't have a proper backup mechanism, it is very hard to bring Jenkins server up and running. So Jenkins job DSL plugin solves that problem. Uh, this plugin attempts to solve the freestyle job problems. It will allow the jobs to be defined with minimal effort. Right? So you can create jobs based on custom rules, using a near uh, rice, nice groovy based domain specific language. And there is no limit in number of jobs. Like you know, you can, you can create hundreds or thousands of jobs and you can store all the configuration uh, inside a repository. And then there is no limit of number of scripts you have. So if you want to bulk update your jobs, let's say you want to upgrade your Java version from 78. So you can just go into a shared library and you can update the particular var file and you can, all the jobs are upgraded on fly. You may not do anything going inside the job configuration at all. And then you can also use external libraries and define common structures for the jobs to be managed. Like I said before, all the common code lies on a central uh, shared library. Uh, in this slide, we are, I wanna talk about how we deploy the Jenkins master itself. How do, how do you take the advantage of Docker to effortlessly spin up a new Jenkins master? Um, how do you install plugins, right? So you go in a traditional freestyle setup, you go con inside the configuration, you choose the plugin you want, and you just upgrade it. So what if you want to uh, update a plugin? So you, you stand up another Jenkins all manually again, or using a thin backup and you can bring up your Jenkins server with that configuration. Uh, here, we have created a Docker image, which will read through the plugins.txt file, which will have the list of plugins to be installed, along with the versions of the plugin. And then we have another folder, which will have a bunch of init scripts. That scripts can do things like configuring the Jenkins, uh, creating the credentials, configuring EC2 Cloud, and then whatnot. Whatever configuration you want to define in your Jenkins, you can write it as a code in a Groovy-based DSL. And then you can place all the scripts in that folder, and then at the time of uh, Docker image startup, you can call all those scripts to be copied inside your settings file. 
Some examples are configuring LDAP. So you can configure all your LDAP uh, using the Groovy file. And then you can configure your matrix auth uh, about the, all the security for your users. And then you can also configure EC2 cloud. So you may wonder how are we managing secrets, right? So the secrets are managed using, uh, it can be managed various number of times. Right now we are using AWS parameter store. So we are storing all our secrets in AWS parameter store, all encrypted. And then when I am starting up the Docker container, we are decrypting the secrets on fly, and we are making that available to an init script, which will create the Jenkins secrets on fly. I'm going to show that in a demo, how we are doing that. So the Docker image is configured in a way such that when a Jenkins server starts up, it'll have all the configuration, all the plugins, uh, and then the pipeline, and even the jobs as well. So that when, when the Jenkins server comes up, you'll have everything available to just go and run your job. And in the demo, I'll show you how to define the Jenkins global configuration, define environment variables, how do you configure LDAP, how do you get secrets from parameter store and then pass on to your uh, Jenkins init script, install the plugins needed, and then configure a C job, which will read through all your Groovy scripts and create a bunch of other jobs. And then programmatic job permissions. So if you're using pipelines, you, you might have faced this, right? So how are you able to control the deployments to production? Now Jenkins has become so much powerful that uh, you can use a single pipeline to, to move your artifact right from, right from the code all the way until the production, right? So you have to make sure that you have a suitable security in place. So Jenkins has a plugin called role-based authorization strategy. So using this plugin, uh, you can control things like uh, in between a stage before you deploy into production. So you can, uh, you can set a message or you can, set, you can even send an email to one of the approvers saying, hey, it is waiting for your approval. When they push the button, the artifacts can be deployed into the production effortlessly. So using this strategy, you can create global roles such as admin, which who can do anything and everything and just a job creator. So let's say you have a DevOps team and they're just for creating the jobs. They, they don't do any deployments. You can create that. And an anonymous role which will just have a read permission for all the jobs. And then you can also uh, configure roles on the slave and also for their CM permissions. So if you create a project role, it'll allow to set only job and run permissions on a project basis. You can also create slave roles, which will allow to set permissions on the slave. And then you can assign that role to the users. So you have an admin role and you have set of, set of users in it and you have a deployer role. So when I'm at that step, wherein I have to deploy into production, all the users in the deploy role will receive an email with the job link. They can just click on the link, click on approve, and then the artifacts can be deployed into production. CI for CI. And that's, and that's really what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. We're talking about using the process that we know so well to make our life easier. It's, the example I'd like to give is the shoemaker's children don't have any shoes, right? We need to make sure that we're using this process and using it for ourselves. So we put Jenkins inside Jenkins to deploy Jenkins. That Somehow that just feels really cool, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the solution that uh, we needed and solved a lot of our problems. And so uh, not only that, but if you want to test something, you want to test new plugins, you have an easy way to stand your Jenkins up in a test environment, stand it up, try things out. Oh, yeah, that's not going to work. Really safe way, really easy way. Take it offline and, and, and have that uh, CI for CI. Uh, so I think that... I think you will find if you adopt this method that it's just going to make your life a lot easier. Yes, there's some work to get through to set up your Jenkins and to set up your shared libraries, but I think Sundeep can attest to it, it being a really worthwhile venture. And honestly, for the time savings, uh, we're already just about ready to break even. Yes, we are. 
So previously, when we want to install uh, or upgrade a plugin, so you cannot directly do that on a production Jenkins, right? And it is very painful to bring up another Jenkins with all the same configuration. So here, because I have all my configuration available inside a container, uh, so we have created an, another pipeline to which basically does the Docker run in the background. And then we just specify the port numbers and the JSON file, uh, which contains the environment details. So let's say I need a new Jenkins server for QA deployments. So I'll write all the configuration of my QA environment inside a JSON file. And at the time of Docker startup, I'll point to that JSON file. So when I run my pipeline, and boom, the Jenkins is available with all the configuration required for a QA environment. So, oh, so we want to walk through this step by step with you because I know that it's a lot of information about automating your master, automating the creation of the job. So Sandeep has a demo he's going to walk through. It has two parts. We're going to show you first the steps that he took in standing up the automation for the Jenkins master. And then part two will be the shared libraries and creation of the jobs. That's your. Okay. So this is kind of a hello world demo. And uh, uh, I'll show you how to uh, configure Jenkins, how, to, how do you specify the plugins inside your repository and then have to create a pipeline using a C job using Jenkins DSL plugin, and then walk you through the various stages of our pipeline. So this is our Docker file. So it starts from the base Docker image, Jenkins LTS, and then on top of that, we install the certificates needed. So we store all our certificates inside a search folder, and then we will, uh, just, we're just copying the certs in user shared certificates. And then whatever you want to install, things like Python, AWS CLI, and then pip, you, you can do that. And then we have a bunch of scripts that we have written to decrypt the secrets, to install the plugins, and all that stuff. So here is your, our plugins.txt file. So this has all the list of plugins that we want to install. In this case, we have just specified latest because we want to shift left, right. So we just don't want to wait till, uh, till a plugin uh, is tested well and then use it. Instead, just use the latest, and if your builds are breaking, just fix them. And then init scripts. So this is the folder where we stored all our configuration. So for example, this script shows how do you configure the Jenkins logs itself. So how do you specify what kind of logs you want to store? And then uh, this script shows basically how to disable a particular protocol. Like I want to disable all JNLP except four because they're unsecured. And then uh, this script shows how do I configure pipeline libraries, right? So I, I talked about using shared libraries. So my shared libraries are available in this repository, Jenkins-jobs. And then I gave the URL, and then I specified the credentials ID, in this case, git-credentials. And then um, I'm specifying a name for my library, dsl-lib. So inside my Jenkins file, I will first reference this library, and that's how it knows where to get the libraries from, share libraries from, sorry. And I can also set the default version. So in this case, I always want to grab my share libraries from master. So I'm specifying master there. So like that, you, so here are examples of some of our scripts. So like that, you can do anything and everything here using Groovy. Uh, to configure your complete Jenkins. Now let's talk about the decrypt.sh file. So this is how we are getting uh, secrets from Amazon, AWS parameter store, basically. So this is my AWS console, so where all my secrets are present. So uh, things like access key, git username, git password, and then secret key, all are stored on Amazon on an encrypted format. So my decrypt.sh script will decrypt all my secrets and make the secrets available in my Jenkins container on the fly. So I, I, we wrote, like there are several ways to do it, so this is what we're doing right now. Um, so it'll basically get all the credentials and then it'll make the credentials available inside the Jenkins to consume. So these are all uh, examples of some of our secrets. And then, uh, I have another Groovy script. So what this script does is, it'll get all the credentials 
and it will create credentials for me. So it get the credentials from the environment, and then it will create credentials like, let's say, git credentials. So it will grab those credentials and store git username and password for me. And then AWS credentials. So it will get the AWS access key, AWS secret key, and then create another credentials. And each credential will have a credentials ID, right? So my ID here is AWS hyphen credentials. Similarly, for EC2, uh, we also, like if you're configuring EC2 cloud, you need a key to connect your EC2 slaves, right? So that's why we are also importing an EC2 key, which will help you to import the credentials. So in this case, our uh, Jenkins is in my laptop, but in let's say if your Jenkins is in AWS, you can take advantage of using IAM roles. So you can use IAM role to let your Jenkins slave uh, talk to any other AWS services, right from getting the secrets to uh, running the builds, creating the slaves, or deploying the artifacts. And then this shows my Jenkins is not running, so I'm just running my, uh, starting up my Docker container. Uh, so I'm just, so this has the Docker run command exposing AD80 and 50,000 for slaves. And then I'm passing my uh, AWS access key ID and secret key ID as a parameters into my container so that it knows how to get my parameters from AWS parameter store. And then I'm specifying my Docker image. So my container is up and running here and it is available on port 8080. Take a while to, to be available. And let's go back and talk about how we create the jobs, right? So we have, uh, so in this, jobs can be created various ways, but our goal is to, uh, is to make a job available which will create all other jobs. I don't want even to log into Jenkins and create even a single job. I want that to be automated too. So we have posted the config.xml file uh, into this Groovy script. So this script will read through, uh, it is like another config.xml file. Um, so it'll have the details like uh, the repository itself. So in this case, my Jenkins job. So I want my C job to read my Jenkins jobs repo. And then I'm specifying my credentials ID, in this case, git hyphen credentials. So that's how it knows uh, how to clone my repository. And then I can give all of the details like, uh, like the configuration, the branch details, um, configuring the git polling and everything. So and I, I, basically this job uses uh, Jenkins job DSL plugin. So that's how it is able to read the Jenkins jobs and, and create other jobs for us. Then, uh, yeah, so showing that we can choose the credentials we want, like let's say if you have various different credentials, so you can give a credentials ID and you can call it with that credentials. So using this Groovy script, uh, when my Jenkins starts up, it'll create a C job for me and it'll read through this source main jobs folder, which will have details of all my Jenkins jobs. So you can create like, you can create a Groovy file for each job or you can all, you can also combine all of your jobs into a single file, uh, which will create other files. So my Jenkins is about to start. Okay, so because I have created a user, a local user here in this case, so we can script through the initial console because I have installed all my plugins as a code and just click on, you can also even skip this step. So now my Jenkins is up and running with all the configuration with all the plugins, and it has created this C job. It just ran now, and then um, it read through all my Groovy files, and it created all other jobs for me. So when my C job runs, it can create folders, it can create views, so you can configure however you want. Like let's say you, have, you want five views, and you want to configure uh, like five, five number of jobs in each view, so you can do that too. So now it created two folders in this case. One is Jenkins pipelines and Maven pipelines. These two are folders. And basically these are multi-branch pipelines. So if I go inside uh, Maven pipelines, 
um, it'll have uh, it'll have nothing basically. So it haven't scanned my repository yet. So we can go inside and we can click on scan through the repository. It'll scan through your branches and then it'll create a job for each of your branch. So uh, when a developer uh, does a check-in, he need not even go to Jen Jenkins console, right? So he, he just checks in the code, um, Jenkins scans through your branch, it'll create a new job for you. And then the, it'll also create a pull request for you, which you can merge later. So let's talk about uh, how, how actually we created the jobs here. So inside source main jobs, so we have two folders here, Gradle build and Maven build. So here we are specifying the folder name as Gradle pipelines and we gave it a display name, also a, a description, and then we have set this job as a multi-branch pipeline, and then we gave, them, uh, gave it a display name, and it has things like uh, your credentials ID. When a job is created, what credentials is it using to clone your repository? And then who is the repo owner? Myself. And then what is the repository name? In this case, Hello World Griddle. So by giving all these details, my C job, uh, creates a folder, and then it will create a multi-branch pipeline inside my folder. In this case, if you see here, uh, it cloned through the Jenkins jobs repository, and it, and it read, read Groovy, uh, two Groovy files, and it created these two folders. So the first folder, Gradle build, um, basically it doesn't have anything because it haven't scanned through the repository yet. So we can also enable git polling for this. Uh, which, is, which can scan through and create the number of jobs as per the number of branches available. So in this case, I just have one branch master. So it created a job for me. So the job is available. Um, and le let's take example of uh, two branches. So here is my Maven pipelines folder. When I go inside Maven build, nothing is available. I just clicked on scan repository. And then it create, like I have two branches here, master and test one. So it created two branches. And then the advantage with multi-branch pipelines is uh, uh, when you check into a branch, it runs the build automatically, and then it will also create a pull request. So you need not even come to Jenkins console for doing anything here. So here is my uh, uh, Gradle build. So let's, uh, so as it is running, let's go and see what's this. Okay, let's, let's see how our Jenkins file looks like. So here is our Jenkins file. So we want to keep our Jenkins file as simple as possible. Like if, if you're running the same command 100 number of times, you can just automate it, right? So here is how uh, we are calling our shared libraries. It starts with at the rate library. So we gave our library name there. In our case, it is dsl-lib. And then uh, agent any, use just whatever free agent is available. And then it has the list of stages. So let's say I want to do a compile step. So it'll execute the compile stage step. It'll go through the commands inside that GUI file, and it'll uh, finish the compile compilation part. Um, similarly, it'll have number of other stages, which will read through all the shared libraries again. So none of the command is written here, right? So everything is coming from shared library. So how many other jobs you create in your Jenkins, it'll all work the same way because it it all has basically the same commands. So similarly, we have things like uh, deploying, it has steps still deploying into production. And this particular stage, uh, it goes through the input stage steps, where it will either send you an email alert or display on your Jenkins console whether you want to approve or deny uh, deploying into production. So let's go through the configuration, and here you can see how we have configured our Jenkins itself. Again, this all, all this configuration is, is coming from basically a GUI files that we have written. So right from setting up the number of executors to setting up the shared libraries. So this shows you how we have configured our, our global libraries. So we specified the name there, and we specified it should come from master. And these are the examples of uh, shared libraries. So basically when it comes to uh, execute compile stage steps, it'll read through the Groovy file, and it'll run the Gradle W clean build command. Like how many number of jobs you have, it'll read the same file, 
So you're confident that it'll, it'll just do build, but not anything else. Similarly, uh, we have uh, a separate GUI file for each step, like compilation, testing, and then do the static analysis and uh, do the input steps if necessary. So going back to uh, the Gradle build, so it started with the build automatically. How many of you are using Blue, uh, Blue Ocean for your uh, radiator? Right, so it is, it is very powerful uh, than any, any other uh, traditional uh, radiators we used, and it, it provides so many other benefits, especially when you're using multi-branch pipelines, right? So it'll display the number of branches you have in your repository, it'll display the pull requests, and, and it is so powerful that you can do everything you want to do from a radiator. Like basically, it's another Jenkins UI, um, but you can, it is more powerful than that. So let's see uh, how we have uh, kept the input step. So this step shows that if I want to deploy to production or not. So uh, we have configured this as a separate stage, and when it reaches this stage, it'll send you an alert if you want to continue deploying it to production. So uh, you can also send an email. Um, if you have uh, other things configured like pager duty, you can also use that to send uh, mobile alerts or anything. Uh, you can specify the email subject. Uh, which, will, which you can utilize the Jenkins uh, global environment variables like build URL and the build tag. So when you receive an email, uh, you'll have the URL of your build. So it'll be easy for you to navigate into the correct build and then uh, process the uh, approval. So this screen shows, uh, shows my stages. So first is my compilation stage where it is doing all the compilation part. And the advantage of Blue Ocean is it'll, it'll show you exactly where your build is. And let's say if you want to see a log of a particular stage, you can just click on that stage and it'll take you to that particular log. Or you can keep watching here and it'll show you what exactly it is running through. Like in a traditional uh, freestyle job setup, you'll have some thousand lines of console output that you have to go through to find a single error. So here, with the advantage of Blue Ocean and the pipeline is you can go to that particular stage and then see what's going on there. So right now it is running the compilation part. It'll, it'll, it is like a live dashboard, so it'll when it reaches the next stage, it'll automatically show you. So the compilation part is, is done. Now it'll go to the unit test part, and then um, wherever you wrote any input step, like if you want to proceed to the next step, or approve or deny uh, a deployment into production, it'll just take you there, and it'll stop there. So if you're watching Blue Ocean, it'll display a message, which will have, which, which shows you like, do you want to proceed with the next step? So right now it has publishing artifacts and deployed into pre-production. <coughs> Let's say you ran a couple of tests like functional testing there, and now it says, do you really want to deploy into production? So you can also set an email alert. I couldn't get it working this, in this laptop. So it, it deployed into production. So by using the pipelines, you have a comfort of uh, seeing, uh, seeing each stage, what is happening inside it, and at the same time you'll have, you can have control of each stage wherein you can configure a particular role such that only the users in, this, in that role uh, can perform the approval process. So you can, also, you can also click on the logs at that particular stage and you can choose, um, you can choose whatever stage you want to see and it'll show you the logs. Um, that's the end of the demo. Uh, what questions you all have? Yes, sir. Um, we're only moving into uh, transmuting shared libraries and more strong pipelines. Okay. And uh, the one thing that seems uh, the only downside of going away from an embedded Jenkins file in the shared stage is if you make a change in the shared library, 
that doesn't recognize or possibly constrain to the DBT field. So if you change it within the Jenkins file that are source code resident, then it actually changes. Have you, um, I, I think it's a reasonable trade off, but have you um, made any changes that to notice that the process has changed and fix all that? Uh, not really. So we're just uh, con using the shared libraries as a separate separate piece of it, and then we're just running the rebuilding it whenever whenever we change a library. Well, and, and also keep in mind that because it's under source control, we're going to have CI for CI. So if we make a change, we can test that change. Uh, anybody else have a question? So the question um, is, uh, will this be available online somewhere? Yeah, sure. It is available in my GitHub. It is available with my name, Sandeep Bobba. So you can, you can see my name in my LinkedIn profile. Um, I'll, you can connect with me in LinkedIn, and we can, we can discuss more. And if you have more ideas, uh, we are happy to uh, you know, share them. So please reach out to us with your questions, yeah. uh, comments, any feedback that you have, we'll be glad to share. Um, anything that you've seen here, we'll be glad to share with you and, and start that conversation. Uh, thank you very much for coming, all of you, and uh, may you have the same uh, good success on your DevOps journey that we have had and enjoy the fruits of the automation. Uh, we're just getting to the good part now. We've just uh, finished a major change and, and I'm really enjoying the fact that we've finally gotten to see uh, the vision unfold and, and we would love to have the same happen for you also. Thank you. Thank you.